Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Today, we have an interview for you. I recently chatted with Andrew Liptak about his upcoming book, Cosplay, A History. This book may surprise you because while that term, cosplay, is relatively new in the vernacular, Andrew's book actually covers a lot of human history. And that history coverage is not too surprising. Andrew got his degree in military history. This conversation will touch on 16th century mummers and Jules Verne and the earliest instances of costuming at fan conventions. You'll hear some names that'll sound familiar if you're a regular listener to the show. Yeah, heads up. Listen for that Hugo Gernsback talk. Uh, So here is our chat. So, Andrew, first off, I know that you costume, but lots of people costume and they don't read a book about its history. So what made you want to write this book? Um, Writing is the only thing I'm really good at. And I've been a journalist for more, you know, more than 10 years at this point. And it just seemed like a good way to put the whole story together rather than like a series of blog posts or newsletter issues or or a feature article somewhere. Um, There's a lot to the story of cosplay and it it goes, you know, back hundreds of years. Um, There's a lot to say about the modern iterations of it where there's, um, you know, in, in 2022, everything that everything that goes into the cosplay world, whether it's 3D printing or racial dynamics or entertainment, the, the mechanics of the entertainment industry, um, all, all of that makes sense to just at least made sense to me to, to put it together into one package as a book, because understanding the entire context of what cosplay is helps give you a better picture of how we come to it today. And, it, you know, it's I've always wanted to write a book because I have lots of books. So I would very much like people to have a book that has my name on it. <laughs> there you go. I think that's fair. It is interesting. And I'm glad you kind of set it up like that because I think for most of us that go to fan conventions or even just are, you know, aware of pop culture, every generation seems to think that they're the ones that are costuming and people weren't really doing it that much before. But we know that's not true, as our discussion will reveal. Um, I do want to level set, though, because I imagine any of our listeners who, as I just said, have gone to conventions uh, or know pop culture, know what cosplay is kind of intuitively. But I also know, because I remember when it came to the forefront as a replacement for costuming in fan groups, (laughs) um, it's a term that doesn't necessarily have an agreed-on definition. So I want to know, how do you define cosplay? The word itself is a mashup of the word costume play. And it was coined in the 1980s by a Japanese writer who wanted to try to find the right term for it and couldn't really like costuming didn't quite have the right effects. Older fans from um, science fiction fandom called it like, uh, you know, the, like a costume masquerade or costume and their costumers. So cosplay seemed to be the right, get captured the right tone for it. So you're, you're costuming and it's, it's playing. So you're, it, it's, it holds up today because it's, it's still in use. Um, my definition is has basically been sort of an act of fandom. Anytime somebody is dressing up as a character out of that love of fandom, out of that sense of, of wanting to become a character, they're dressing up to relate to a story somehow. And when you think cosplay, you think superheroes or Star Wars or anime. Um, my, I wanted to make sure that my definition was really broad because, um, you know, a story is not always fictional. It, it can be non-fictional. So in the book, I include things like, Maybe it's not quite cosplay, but it's sort of under this big, broad umbrella of other activities where somebody is relating to a story. So I include some things about reenacting and protesters. I think it's, I basically see it as anytime you're you are you're dressing up to relate to a story somehow, whether that that is to you know dress up as somebody who is basically doing charitable work at a hospital or just going to a convention and basically things like that. There is an instance of historical cosplay that you talk about in this book that charmed me so utterly. And I had not ever read about it before, even though it involves a person that I really, really like. Uh, And that is Jules Verne. And he apparently threw quite a party in 1877. And you relay that story. Will you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. So Jules Verne, if if you don't know, he's the science fiction author who wrote 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea from the Earth to the Moon. And he was a he was a really big author. He 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 was known all over the world for his stories. It seems like he had a bit of a 
I don't say troubled personal life, but like he, you know, his family had its ups and downs, and um, his son was getting into some trouble and was about to be shipped off to uh, basically a, a penal <laughs> a penal colony or or like a really strict school of some sort, and he basically wanted to take his family's mind off of the troubles, so they basically commissioned you basically threw a big party. It's, you know, you're about to ship your your ship your delinquent son off to school. Why wouldn't you you <laughs> throw throw a costume party? <laughs> and what I what I found most interesting about this is that when like they sent out invitations, it was apparently very expensive, and they they put a lot of they put a lot of effort into this. People showed up to this party dressed as his characters. Um, I I don't remember off the top of my head if records survived about which what costumes they were, but he he certainly had a, a really big impact on the literary world at the time. So I I can't imagine that like you know people were dressing up you know with with some of those you know influences now they might not have had you know the direct visual references that they have that we have today where you know you can freeze frame a movie and you know get a character from every (laughs) angle but you know there's certainly a lot of examples of where people were sort of you know dressing up to be inspired you know as inspired by this and you know when you're you know a kid and you're dressing up for your own costume party you're doing the same thing You're, you're trying to you know approximate what you imagine those characters might look like and um i i really wish you i you know, knew what he might have thought of that. I, I imagine that it, it's pretty, you know, like any author or any TV personality or, or film actor, you know, we'd be cut, you know, utterly charmed by the idea of seeing your characters come to life. And this isn't the only instance of that. Um, one thing that didn't make it into the book, because I learned about it, um, like right after I finished edits, is um, Arthur Conan Doyle also did this. Um, he didn't he didn't throw a party, but he would dress up. Um, he, he's, he's obviously the author known uh, for creating uh, Sherlock Holmes. Um, but his favorite character wasn't Sherlock Holmes. It was a guy named uh, Professor Challenger, who is uh, featured in a uh, you know the, a book called The Lost World, where some explorers go off and discover this isolated plateau in South America where they they discover dinosaurs in this in this lost world. And apparently, he dressed up as his own character every now and then. And I found that to be a really a really fun little anecdote. And so. And there's even there's instances further back. Um, I was just at Star Wars Celebration and, and I was talking with somebody in line and they mentioned that, oh, I studied art history. And there was this Roman emperor who, who dressed up as Hercules, or at least there, there are busts of uh, statues of him dressed up as Hercules. I, I think I think that the, the notion of us dressing up as characters to sort of relate to the story is something that has lived with us for a very, very long time. And it, it just sort of shows to go just how much of storytelling creatures we are. We just we just really like to sort of immerse ourselves in that world. In some cases, it's just by imagining it, but in other cases, um, it's by you know trying to figure out what outfit this character might have worn and you know how they might have acted or looked. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I really am fascinated by this. The more I I looked through your book and read all of these stories, I kept being struck by the fact. That I have theoretically always known, but when you're seeing it all grouped together, it really drives the point home that there have always been people doing this throughout history. You go way back through history, including things like mummers and pagan folk traditions back to the 16th century. So this is something that as a species, humans have always loved to do. And I'm curious, I think you're you kind of intimated it just now talking about how we we are always trying to tell stories, but why do you think we so instinctively turn to costumes for everything from warding off evil to just partying as superheroes and all points in between? Like a costume is a quick cultural go-to almost around the globe as a way to do this, which I find fascinating. Yeah. So as I said, I think we're we're storytelling creatures. It's it's our most important technology, I think, as as a species. If we, if we really want to get really philosophical about it, it's it's a way that we can convey information to one another. It's it's a way that we share our values and and our you know adventures and and thrills and excitements. And our imagination is really really great. If you describe something, you can have a picture of it in your head. What things like books and now, movies or comic books, they do, they, let, they allow us to sort of make those thoughts concrete, which is really this, a really ma- in my mind, a really magical way to look at this, because it lets us transfer what was once thought into a sort of telepathy that we can share from person to person. Why we put costumes on and why we pick up props, I think, is just a way to sort of extend that and just to make those thoughts a little bit more manifest and to just to bring them, those thoughts a little bit more to life for the benefit of somebody who's on the, on the sidelines. 
whether that is somebody in a captive audience on a stage or sitting in a, in a movie theater or at a convention, you, you know, you see these characters come to life and you can believe for a second that, you know, these stories, these thoughts, these ideas, these lessons now come together into, in, into the real world. And that, that's, I think, one of the, the real powers of cosplay is that it lets you bring these characters to life. And, you know, the, we really love, you know, these are, these are really phenomenal stories. Like, you know, I, I'm a, if, if, once people read the book, you'll see how I'm a big Star Wars fan. Um, this is a really, you know, her, story of heroics. It's, this, it's a story of how people really triumph over evil and they make decisions that help them save the world. And I think that, you know, we are always striving to sort of see those things in the world and, it, you know, made manifest. And costumes just help us make that a little bit better. I, I, don't, I don't know about you or, or any listeners, but like when I see Darth Vader, I get a chill that goes down my spine because, you know, it's, it, it's a real visceral thing. I'm around stormtroopers a lot more and, and they, they're terrible shots. So I'm not quite as worried about them, but you know, when, <laughs> when you see, when you see other characters like that, that, you know, really elicit that, that sense of fear, that real gut instinct of emotion. And, you know, you see them in front of you. It's, it's a really powerful thing. Um, and I've heard actors talk about this, like um, somebody was talking about, you know, coming up against Darth Vader and that just being really like, Oh my God, it's real. Because, you know, it, it's, it's a really imposing costume. It's a really imposing character. And the same thing is like when you see a character that's really heroic. Well, if I see a, a you know, a, a little girl uh, seeing um, Ahsoka Tano for the first time or Princess Leia, and it's like their favorite character ever, you know, that's got to be a really powerful thing for them because they, you know, all that character represents is now made manifest. And it's no longer an intangible thing. It's a, it's a tangible thing in the real world. And if if the character is real in the world everything that they represent must be too and i so i think that's that's why you know cosplay is, can be such a powerful thing that's a beautiful way to look at it i had not really thought about it in those terms um i do want to talk about some more specific historical things because i kept finding just gems in the text that jumped out at me one of them was your mention of political protest costumers from the 1800s who were known as the Fantasticals. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this was a really fun thing that I came across. And it was one of those things that was just like a ra crazy random happenstance, just going through archives. I think I was going through the um, say Library of Congress's archives um, online and just trying to like just typing in costume and just seeing what, what popped up. So the Fantasticals were... This needs a little bit of setup just to, to fully understand the context. There was, you know, 1800s, there was a um, U.S. was still a fairly young nation. There was a lot of sort of consternation about the state of the nation's militia system. And, you know, people would be conscripted into helping out. And there was a, a lot of corruption and just general disillusionment with the, the, the organizations that were set up to, you know, presumably protect the country or protect the region or whatever. What people started doing was dressed, and this was largely a, a phenomenon confined to like the Philadelphia area and the New York City area. Um, and it, it expanded a little bit out from there, uh, but what really, it, it was sort of in that corner of, of the country. And what people started doing was just dressing up as these ridiculous looking soldiers. Um, and it was really just, it was sort of a form of protest. Um, it was a, it was an idea that like, you know, if we make this, you know, sort of shine a, shine a satirical light on the, the problems that we are seeing with this, you know, people will, will re recognize just how, how ridiculous and, and how many problems there are. And then, you know, we see this today, you know, look at the daily show or take your pick for any, any political comedy routine that's out there. You know, your satire is a really, is a really powerful tool in and of itself. And so what these what these folks would do is they would just dress up in these outlandish uniforms, like swords that were way too large or, you know, ridiculous amounts of ornamentation and buttons and, and ribbons and um, uniforms. They, they would just throw these really loud parades where they would just go up and down the street. And it, it, I imagine it's a little bit like, you know, any any, uh, you know, cosplay group which, which, that can be described as like it's a drinking group where we sometimes dress up in, in costume. You know, a lot of these guys, we get, you know, fantastically drunk and then run around and, and make a lot of noise and, and drive everybody nuts. And then you go off to, the, to do the next one. And like uh, there, there was a guy that there was one of the stories there was that they, they elected a guy who was probably not all there like, as their leader. And it was just, you know, they, they were just sort of showing that just how ridiculous this, this militia system was. 
And over over time, it sort of became it morphed out of that satirical thing, and it became more of like an institution in and of itself. Or you know, this is just the thing you do. You know, on this day, you you go in this these loud parades, you you honk horns, and you dress up in these ridiculous costumes, and like a lot of communities just hated them because they were so obnoxious. <laughs> Um, and there's, um, some stories of where they were arrested and, you know, because they were like, they would, they would get chased out of town because they're just being, being just that annoying. And it's basically just one of those things that just, it, it sort of just grew with, with time. And that's just, that's like, like one example. And, it, and I sort of came across that while looking at like, you know, how with this idea that costumes can be used to relate to a story, this is just one example of many throughout history where this has happened when I was working for a, a tech site called The Verge, Handmaid's Tale had just come out and um, there was a, it was a major abortion bill in Texas. And, um, you know, protesters started showing up as handmaids from, from The Handmaid's Tale. And they still do this today. There was an entire organization that sort of sprang up to sort of try to get handmaids to, to stand in front of each state capital across the country. And I think that that's, again, costuming can really, in bringing these ideas to life is this very tangible thing. And it, it can really sort of jolt somebody into thinking, you know, to realizing what's what's going on. And, you know, this is something we see a lot. You know, the, the, the Tea Party movement had its own protesters and they dressed up as revolutionary figures because, you know, people relate to those stories. And it makes them recognize and, and sort of understand what their messaging is. There's other examples from the book as well. There's a, there's a guy in Turkey who, who dressed up as Darth Vader during some of the, the protests there. And I'm, I'm sure there's, you know, any, anytime you have got big, you know, really big movements, you'll, you'll see other people dressing up. Uh, another, another really good example was um, the suffrage movement, where women would dress up as Columbia or um, Lady Liberty. And, um, you know, there, I, there's some pictures that we that are included in the book that are from the, the National Archives, just these phenomenal pictures of, of these women dressed up in costume on the, on the Capitol, you know, at, at, this, at this point in moment where they didn't have as many rights as they do today. And it's, it's just incredible to see. another historical connection to costuming and cosplay that I I wanted to talk about because I know some of our listeners participate in this group, but not everyone might know about it. And it's pretty interesting. Uh, You trace in the book the origins of the SCA. Will you kind of give a brief rundown of what the SCA is and how it started? Yeah. So the, the SCA stands for Society for Creative Anachronism. It's, it's basically the folks who dress up as, as medieval knights in, in, in armor. And it's, the scope of the group is a little bit broader than that. It's, it's sort of bringing the, you know, the medieval world to life. Um, so like, it's connected to like the idea of rent fairs, of re- medieval reenactments. And the, the group itself sort of comes out of this weird branch of science fiction fandom, 1950s, 1960s, where cosplay wasn't was sort of a thing, dressing up in costume was sort of a thing at that point. Um, but what happened is that there was a, um, over in Berkeley, California, a bunch of science fiction fantasy authors sort of got together for like this um, event at their house. And they were basically encouraged to dress up as sort of pseudo medieval characters. And, you know, they, they all showed up, they had a good time, and then they decided that they would go do it again and again. And it basically grew into this much larger group. So um, like authors like Paul Anderson or um, Marion Zimmer Bradley were, were part of this. And, it was just this idea of, again, sort of getting back to the idea of relating to a story, whether it is real or fictional. And medieval Europe is sort of its own story in and of itself, because we have this really peculiar idea of what is medieval and like what is actual reality. I think a, a lot of ways the, the SCA uh, and I, I'm not a member, I'm not a member. And I, uh, this is just something I sort of touch on in the book, but they sort of have just an idea of what medieval Europe might have been like. And it's sort of of really influenced by like you know the tales of king arthur and you know a lot of those myths those fantastic myths that we we were uh, probably all familiar with and, and uh, rather than like as a straight up historical reenactment group it was sort of like playing with the idea of what we think of as medieval king arthur's europe rather than what what it actually might have been like and i think anytime you sort of have a, you know, there's sort of this drift towards reality at some point where you um you know stuff will tend to get a a little bit more realistic over time, but for the most part, it, it's it's sort of a little bit more informed by this this idea and this this uh, love of the love of this this um, of, of those of those stories, and it, it sort of grew from there. It, one of the the folks I spoke with talked about how 
a couple of years after this, they basically showed up at, at a, a big convention in California, uh, one of the world cons. And, um, you know, there was alongside science fiction authors talking about the future. There were, you know, these people dressed up as knights in shining armor, doing demonstrations in the front lawn of this hotel and, um, you know, hanging out in the hallway. It, it's interesting just to see how this sort of started in science fiction fandom, because that's where sort of all these folks sort of knew each other from, and it sort of grew into its own thing. So now we have this in, huge network of, of Renaissance fairs all over the country. You can go to, you know, established permanent locations that are attractions or, you know, there's, you know, the ones that will, you know, it's basically an outdoor convention where they'll, you know, show up with tents and armor and, you know, have a good time over the course of the weekend. And um, the, the SA itself has become this massive organization um, that, you know, you know, thousands of people are part of all over the world. And it's just, it's a really, it's a really great example of community and people just sort of sharing in this this a sharing in the community but sharing in this idealized shared story with one another it's so fascinating to me like the level of structure that exists now and knowing that it just kind of started with some people wanting to kick around in fun outfits is pretty great i'm glad that you mentioned worldcon because you mentioned that in the book as kind of one of the first real inflection points of this 20th century move into convention costuming um that the first worldcon was kind of the first time we saw it happen so I am hoping you will talk a little bit about organized fandom or sometimes disorganized fandom and its ties to cosplay history. Yeah, uh, fandom was a really strange and, and very um, sort of wild west of fan organizations over the years, especially around the New York City area where a lot of these authors were from. So science fiction proper, you know, it, it, there's, I like to like, I like to like in history to a geologic formation. So where you have, you rarely have definite breaks where all of a sudden you have one thing that was one thing and then another thing that is a different thing. Right. You know, right next to each other where there's a straight, clear line of delineation. History often has like these trails that sort of extend out and merge into other things or they, they sort of uh, change and sort of weave in and out. Science, it, you know, trying to find like a, a put a pin where science fiction comes from is a really difficult thing to do because you know you, you can always <laughs> find something that comes before it um you know yes. you've got jules verne but then jules verne was in, in influenced by you know folks before him and then like you know mary shelley had influences and like you know there's academics who say that you know science the first science fictional novel you know was back in like the ancient greek times and you know it's i i like to sort of talk about stuff like you know what, what is modern fandom and modern cosplay and modern science fiction look like. And a lot of, yeah, when it comes to that, like you have a couple of very clear points that, you know, you are definitely in a point where there is science fiction, but you know, it's, it's nebulous as to what sort of came before or after science fiction had been around for, you know, a little while. There's a, there's an influential magazine called amazing stories that, that was first published in 1926 by a guy named Hugo Gernsback. That's largely seen as sort of the birth of modern science fiction because it was, uh, their stories about the future, about technology. And it, it, it's sort of like the, the, the early thing that looks the most like what we have is modern science fiction, even though it's, it, 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 today it would be very outdated that magazine amazing stories was re really influential because a it spawned a lot of imitators from other rival companies who wanted saw that hey there's an audience for this let's jump on this bandwagon and, and go from there um and there's a lot of fans who were like hey i like these stories i want to read more of them and they were consuming all of these things um what gernsback really did that was in interesting was he put a letter column in those magazines and it was basically encouraged those fans to write in comments about the story um just I like this thing, or, you know, I want to meet other science fiction fans. And he basically set up a, an actual network of, of clubs, um, the science fiction league to try to get, you know, I, I think his reasons were, were very self, you know, self-centered. I think he was mostly interested in making sure that he had a block of people that were in, you know, continually engaged with science fiction, fantasy literature. And, you know, they would continue to go back to his magazines over and over again. Regardless of his intentions, um, you know, this, these clubs really helped get the way to, to get fans to talk to each other. They'd write each other letters through these magazines. They would, and they would like, hey, this person's from New York too. I'll go try to, you know, I'll track them down. Um, and they would go and do this. And they, they formed their own, their own in-person clubs where they could get together and talk about science fiction fantasy books. And this is sort of where we see the, the roots of modern fandom is that they are people who are, 
gathering because of the shared interest. And when you get a couple of people, people to gather in a room, they have a lot of a fun time. They talk about their favorite stories. They nerd out a bit. And then they realize like, hey, there's more people out there all over the place. And let's all of us get together into one big room and talk about the thing we love the most. And before 1939, there were a handful of other small conventions around the country and around the world. There was one in the UK. There's a couple around the United States. There's sort of these proto conventions. But the, this was the first world science fiction convention was like a, a really big officialish type thing. It was it was a times for the World's Fair that year. And they it attracted fans from all over the country. So not just the New York based fans, um, all of whom were squabbling with one another and, and you know, had all these they, they did. Some of them didn't really like each other very much, but they were able to bring in fans from, you know, California, like Ray Bradbury and Horace Ackerman and uh, Moroho, who is, uh, I'll get to in just a second. And they, um, you know, this is a, a, a gathering as a, as a community, a, a, a real sort of inflection point for this community that, you know, hey, we can get together and we can talk about this stuff. And look, there's people that share my interests that are like me. And it's it's a real validation for all those people to say like, you know, this, this is something I don't, you know, I don't know many people in my life that really like this sort of thing, but now there are others out there that that's a really a validating thing for one's existence. And I think a, a lot of people who have been a fan of anything will, will sort of recognize that. So that was, yeah, that's sort of the foundational base layer for all of this. This big convention happened in 1939 and two fans, uh, Forrest and Moroho, they show up, they decide to w- dress up in costume. They're from the a movie called The Things to Come from uh, based off of an H.G. Wells book. And um, they sort of arrived and everyone's like, what the hell are you doing? This is weird. <laughs> <laughs> and which is, you know, not not uncommon reaction whenever anybody in costume shows up unexpectedly. He just hangs around and he, he gets a couple pictures taken of him. The, the uh, force got some pictures of himself t- taken and uh, his girlfriend is there with him who she actually she's actually the one who made the costumes um he has for a long time gotten a lot of the credit but she's the one who actually made them the next year the the world they decided that hey we're gonna hold this convention again uh, a year later in chicago and forrest and morojo show up again in costume and a whole bunch of other people show up in costume and they decide like you know this is really cool they walked around the con they decided to walk out in public. Um, they got stopped by a cop um, who basically thought they were all nuts. And it wasn't until one of them pulled out his, like he was actually a government worker and he pulled out his ID and said, no, I'm not, a, I'm really not this crazy person. Um, and they ended up going over to a newspaper office to say like, hey, we're time travelers from the future. We're here for our interview that's going to run tomorrow. <laughs> um, and as far as I could tell, that never, they didn't really quite go for that. But they, it was just an idea of the, just, you know, fans being goofy. And you, know, you have to remember, these are also kids that are like 18, 20, 21 years old, they, you know, the same age as a lot of cosplayers today. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we, the modern day, we like doing a lot of goofy stuff in, in kit. And, um, you know, it, it, it's a nice little shared point from, you know, people a hundred years ago were doing the same thing. What? I never did anything <laughs> silly in costume ever. Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> And then the next year, the con went to Denver and people did it again. And they um, decided to hold like a costume contest at this convention. And um, people brought these really elaborate costumes. They brought like one of them spent, um, you know, months putting feathers, you know, making a bird costume, uh, like I was like a bird head. And then um, another one fished a, a big piece of, I don't know, it was a glass or plastic, like for a, hel- a like a spaceship helmet. Um, Robert Heinlein, who is the, uh, the author of Starship Troopers, was a guest of honor and he didn't realize this costume contest, but then he decided I'm going to go as um, the most realistic, the world's most realistic robot. And, you know, there was just a lot of other, a lot of other stuff like that. And from, from there, what happens is that this becomes a, a pillar of the, of the, co- of the, the convention scene is like, at, at, of course, at every con now you have a costume contest where people get to just, it's usually, it was usually like the last day of the convention and people just go to hang out and have fun and, you know, just have a good time. And then throw in some prizes for like the best, the best uh, costume or, or it, you know, it would vary from, from place to place. So what they would do, um, but actually looking at, there's a great organization called FANAC, which documents a lot of this fan history. And what they're doing is they, they have gotten scans of a lot of like the documents that they were sending out to people. So usually what would happen is that a member of the con would get a couple of updates ahead of time saying like, you know, this is where the convention will be and this is the rate and, you know, this is what we're having. And this, you know, here's a letter from the organizers saying how excited we are. 
And like over time, you're starting to see them saying like, oh, yes, and this year we'll have a costume contest again, which is going to be our favorite thing. Here's some ideas. Um, you know, it just became a big pillar, uh, you know, a big part of this that, you know, just happened year after year. Um, and as it grew, it became more formalized. Um, you know, the costume contest was, it was a masquerade. It had rules that were set down. There's entire organizations that came out of it. Uh, um, the Costuming Guild, which helped set up those rules, um, came out of it. And they set up their own conventions and programming tracks at World Cons to sort of, because people were like, they might, yeah, I might, the science fiction stuff is kind of fun, but like, you know, I really liked sewing. I really like making costumes. And it, it sort of helped demonstrate that like, fandom is not limited to just being an enthusiast for something. You can, you're, you know, one's fandom can uh, appear in different ways. Um, it can be a, you know, you can write fan fiction. You can be the super reader who collects all of the magazines, or you can make the costumes based off of the cover art of, of the, of the books and magazine covers. So that's sort of how costuming became a thing within science fiction fandom is, is it was this, this, it just sort of grew little by little as more people sort of realize. And I think it just, ta- it just takes one person like Forrest or in Morojo that's to say, Oh, I really like that character. I can dress up as them. I have this shirt and my, you know, my wardrobe or if i do if i put this thing on it will make me look like this character and and, you know as as we we were storytelling creatures we've always sort of gravitated towards adding a prop to you know if we're making a story and you know that just helps that bring that to life just a little bit more and now it's the funnest part You mentioned some of these early costumes, and this entire book is really, for someone that loves cosplay and costuming and history, it is just full of photos that are really astounding. Some of the earliest of these convention costumes, including Forrest Ackerman's costume in 1939 and others that, uh, they're clearly older photos, but there is an element to them that feels so entirely familiar to anyone who has been to an event like this in the modern era. Um, I want to know how you managed to get a hold of all of those amazing photographs. So there's a couple, couple places. Um, I've been a, a file first member for since 2003, 2004, and I've carried a camera with me to a lot of events. So a, a whole bunch I took myself over the years. I announced the book back in 2019, spring of 2019. And I actually announced on the day that I was leaving star Wars celebration in Chicago and I, you know, we'd known that we we're going to be announcing it that day. So I, and I was going to the con. So I was like, all right, well, we, I need to start taking pictures for, for re, I'm quoting air quotes here, research, not just taking in all the, the, the amazing costumes there. But over the, to, the course of 2019, I ended up going to um, Celebration. I went to Dragon Con. I went to Rhode Island Comic Con. And um, I didn't make it to New York Comic Con because my daughter was born like the week before. I wasn't allowed to leave. Uh, I went to uh, Granite State Comic Con, which is a, a really small local convention, and Boston Fan Expo. And all along the way, it was it was taking pictures of you know the state of the modern of modern cosplay, and and specifically looking for you know costumes that had been three D printed or that had been made out of foam or you know five first members and you know every you know every, anything that sort of struck my eye that w- that would be really cool you know, just like, A, I wanted to document a cool costume, um, but also just sort of the idea of like, you know, um, I'm looking for stuff to, to for this book. Um, obviously, I wasn't born in the 1930s and, and wasn't around for a lot of those conventions. So some of those came from uh, some places. There's, there's one guy I have to really call out is uh, John Coker, who is a longtime fan, uh, science fiction fan. And he had this really incredible archive of pictures to use um, that he he really graciously let me use for the book, and these were from you know all over the place, nineteen thirties, nineteen you know forties, fifties, sixties, and it was really you know his generosity to let me use those really helped include them in in the book. Um, and there was other authors too. Um, the um, late Mike Resnick was a long uh, he's a science fiction author um, who incidentally bought my my first short story for a magazine called Galaxy's Edge, and. He had been a long time staple in this in the science fiction uh, costuming community, and um, he had taken pictures of cons for most of the time that he was doing that. So his his widow and, and daughter were able to provide a couple that we were able to use, and just or just generally 
you know, looking through a lot of the pictures that he, that they had was, was really great just to get an idea of the complexity and like the real craft that was going into these, into these costumes, you know, in the sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, there's other sources as well. Um, in some cases we went to, um, archives, national archives, library of Congress, Florida. I got some pictures from a Florida archive of for Halloween. UC Riverside has a, has a massive science fiction collection um, and fandom collection. And they had, and I, I found, a, I wish I had found it a little bit earlier in the process because I probably would have gotten more f- pictures from there. But there's a guy who had taken off uh, pictures of cons for years and he had um, some really incredible pictures of um, fans in, in costume. Um, there's a really great picture of some uh, that I included in the book about Star Trek fans who were hanging out at the con at, at a con. Um, and, it, you know, you look at their faces and it just looks like they were, they could have been any of any of the kids I saw at Star Wars Celebration. You know, the same enthusiasm was there and the same excitement for being there. Um, and actually, uh, so yeah, they, they, there, there was, there's a whole lot of places where we, where we were able to source, source images from. And along the same lines, you know, we we're able to get a lot of good, um, you know, interviews from folks who were involved in the fan community from there, um, there's a woman named Astrid Bear, who's um, the daughter of, of of Paul Anderson, and she had been in involved in fandom from from all of her life. She provided pivotal information about like you know what was what was it like when Star Trek came in, and she had some great pictures of herself in Star Trek in a Star Trek costume, um, and it, you know stuff that really impacted. So there's you know there's a lot of people here who, alive who are still familiar with you know they they were watching you know the the, the fan scene and, and seeing these early, these early days of costuming. Um, and they were able to, you know, share those memories and, and really sort of help add to the book in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, so um, yeah, that, that, that's where a lot of that came from is just, is a lot of research, a lot of interviews. It wasn't just all, just all historical folks. Um, it, you know, it was also people who are involved now. Um, I, you know, I talked to people about, you know, 3d printing and um, you know, what was like, how did like the internet change things in the 1990s? Um, um, Adam Savage of the Mythbusters was a really great um, source for that. You know, he, he's been involved in the costume world for years, and, and you know he had some really great insights into how you know the modern the modern movement has sort of uh, come about. It's interesting that you mentioned the modern movement because I do, like I said at the the top, there is this sense I think for everyone that like they are the first. They are living through the first great explosion of fan costuming. But one of the things that I always love seeing, and you include a lot of it in your your book, you have a, a section that's specifically about when Star Wars premiered and how quickly there were people, certainly they did not have like the the levels of like vacuum-formed ABS plastics that we have today, but almost instantly by the end of 1977, there were already people putting together stormtrooper costumes. Uh, Will you talk about some of those? Because I know that we both share a love of this particular topic. So if you type in like 1977 Star Wars costumes, you'll find some really great examples. StarWars.com interviewed a couple of folks and there's every now and then you'll see somebody post up a picture. Oh, this was me back in, you know, you know, June 77 that I, you know, worked on this costume. Um, There's a guy I found. um, This is, is actually, again, some of the stuff just sort of happened, you know, spontaneously. I, I think I, I announced that I was doing the book and, um, you know, on Twitter and somebody got in touch saying, like, oh, but yeah, my cousin made these really incredible costumes in, you know, in the 1970s and, and 80s. And it got me in touch with him. And this is a guy named David Ray. He has sadly since passed away. He, he died not too long after I spoke with him. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, several months later, he had uh, cancer. Um, but I was thrilled to talk to him and he... He, he was a really gracious interviewee because he he walked me through what he did and he was basically said well I was a kid and um you know I liked costumes and I ended up um going to see Star Wars you know 30 40 times in theaters and I just took a notebook with me and I would just jot down notes and sometimes he would get so wrapped up in the movie that he would forget to take notes and I'm like oh darn I have to go see the movie again and oh, um no. yeah oh no <laughs> <laughs> twist my arm and so he he basically went and he made stuff out of cardboard. He got an old army helmet. Um, he would just cobble these costumes together and it looked really great. I mean, like th- there's a point to where like, you know, if, you know, if you're a real accuracy person, you're like, Oh, that's not really accurate, but it, it's, it was more like just the spirit behind it. You know, you just see how much, how much he cared about the costume and, and the character that, you know, he was able to build these really fantastic looking costumes. 
Um, because like, and, and you know, they were good enough so that the local movie theater like hired him to basically walk around in 1978 and 1979. Because back then, movies would just run continually. They they wouldn't be like the short you know, what, three or four weeks that they run in theaters nowadays. Like, you know, Star Wars was in theaters for months and, and year, it got re-released a whole bunch of times in 78 and 79. And so they, they hired him to basically, you know, him and his, his, his siblings would like, they dressed up in these costumes. They, they walked around the theater and, you know, it's a stormtrooper, it's Darth Vader. Um, he made a Boba Fett costume. He went on and made um, like Batman and um, I want to say uh, Planet of the Apes costumes. Yeah, there's just a, a lot of creativity and, and you know, people were, were doing these, costumes and really you know they're making them out of really novel ways like you know uh, you know cardboard or, or sheet metal or you know they're sewing stuff together um and these are not necessarily people within that that capital f fandom community who might have put the skills to use through that through that community but they were just like they're just coming into it blind and like you know this is how you you know uh, you know this is how i put this together star trooper or, or make this sort of helmet and it, 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 it's just a real stroke of creativity, especially when you consider that, you know, there weren't the plethora of, of images that are available these days. Like nowadays, like a really good example of this is in 2016, when right before Rogue One premiered, um, Lucasfilm brought the short trooper costumes to Celebration in London. And people took really you know, high resolution photos of all those costumes they were able to identify some of the used parts and what went into them, you know, down to like the ribbing on the undersuit and the pants and the, the right brand of boot that, that they, they bought to use for that costume. And within months, they had already begun sculpting their own costumes um, out of this armor and they were vacuum forming it. So I was able to go to the Rogue One premiere as a short trooper before the film premiered. Um, you know, people had made the helmets and they made all these other parts. And yeah they, they, you know that's we, we could do that because we have all these resources nowadays but back then you know you you had just you had to go to the theater over and over again you might or you might have like a random not very clear picture in star log or or a newspaper um you certainly didn't have sort of the hands-on access that you had you have these days and you know the the the, the world has changed so much I mean, video games will release 100, pa 100 plus page documents, you know, outlining every single angle of a character or here's the paint. Here's the exact paint color scheme. Yeah. For, for Halo Infinite, they uh, uh, three, four, three industries released this massive document for for cosplayers saying, like, this is what all these parts look like. And this is what all the colors you need. And this is what from every angle. And, you know, we just these folks did the same thing without all of that. And it's just really incredible to see that level of creativity persist. I'm so grateful that you captured some of those stories for this book because it is one of those things that um, I'm I'm blown away by their workmanship, even though you said like in a lot of cases they're kind of throwing it together, but the ingenuity is off the charts. So it's really, really nice that we have a, a, a way that that's been documented for future generations to enjoy. <laughs> There are so many little gifts in this book. Like for someone that loves costumes, like I said, there are just many, many things that I know surprised me. But I want to know to close out, what was the most surprising thing you learned while you were researching this? Hmm. That, that's a hard one. I've, I've been trying to think about like what this might be. There's there's so yeah, there's, there's so many like just random little anecdotes. And, and that's sort of one of the things about history is you, you pull in a thread and there's always a little bit more to the story. And so I think one of the things that blew my mind and really helped shape some of the book was the idea that the reason that we have, you know, you see so many people using 3D printers these days is not because they are suddenly like, you know, magically widely available for no reason. Uh, the patents expired on the original technology. And because those patents expired, companies don't need to pay licensing fees to use the technology. And as a result, they can make a cheaper device. And if you, it's a little bit cheaper to make. You can maybe drop the price a bit. And so the price on, the, on a 3D printer has gone steadily down. You know, it's still a couple hundred bucks, but, you know, it's not, if you're a dedicated customer and this is something that you're doing a lot of, you know, it, it's, a, it's an investment you can make in order to make those parts and that you might be looking to make. And I, I mean, I have one here at my house and I never, you know, I never would have thought that I'd have, have, a, have a, it's a little one, but, you know, I've made costume parts on it before um, and I've made little toys for my kids and, um, I've got friends who have, you know, two or three of them and they make entire costumes on them. 
what that sort of helped me realize is that the and, and this is sort of a broader picture of of a, just the idea of access to to cosplay as the price goes down access goes up and that appears in a whole lot of ways so if you have you know you don't need a multi thousands of dollars to, to make a vacuum forming machine if you want to make a short trip or now you can you can get buy a 3d printer or if you have access to one you don't even need to own it you can go to a local library and, and print up parts that's something i've done you can make a costume that's a lot cheaper than ever before now, it might still be an investment but it's not quite what it used to be um right the same thing goes for materials um eva foam the stuff that is in your yoga mat you know that is an incredible cause uh, you know material for cosplayers to use and you know people realize have realized for years that you know this you can make really incredible armor out of it and there's a lot of ingenuity that goes with that it's also really cheap you can you can go nowadays you can go to joan fabrics and buy sheets of it um you can buy a yoga mat and you can you know, make parts out of it i think that was sort of like the, the biggest revelation i had because it sort of transformed the book from a, an idea of like, all right, these events happen, and this is sort of what it tells us about fandom into a, a, a an economic story about how this is why this has expanded, and and I I really believe that it's it's sort of the the access to cheaper materials and the widespread knowledge of how to do this stuff, you know, you know that's helped by um, you know forums or or Facebook pages or YouTube, um, it you know it teaches a, a much greater population how to do this and that's also helped along by the idea that when you see sort of cosplay in action whether it's um through a you know friend of yours on facebook who might have been got been to a convention and you happen to see them tagged in a picture or you know if you see the main characters on the big bang theory cosplaying and it's like oh that's the thing i can do and, and that and that sort of helps guide that access along um and so you know that that was a, that was a really big revelation that I had that really helped change the book is that it's it's the reason that cosplay is exploding so much is that it, now just more people can do it more people can afford to do it and um it's not limited to just a really narrow segment of the population of of folks who can afford to have you know to dump up a thousand or two thousand dollars on a, on a really high-end costume or, or to spend a decade toiling away on it Actually, there's another surprising thing that I learned um, that that's kind of fun is that another technological advance that really helped uh, the introduction the introduction of the uh, Blu-ray, because what that did oh yeah is you know if, if you're watching on um, in a theater you can't pause it. VHS does not quite have the right resolution, and when you pause it, you get all the lines across. Um, but then when you have DVDs come up around, you can oh you can pause, you can freeze frame it, and you can sort of get a good glimpse of what. A piece of armor is but even then it's still not quite as you know the the the, the resolution is not quite there what blu-ray did is it really let you see those 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 costumes in a really high resolution that you people had never seen before absent of actually seeing the costume in person if if, if a studio happened to like tour them around or um you know if you happen to come across one if you're like a, a really wealthy collector or or, or whatever uh, an anecdote that was shared with me from a, a, a local Boba Fett cosplayer is that once when the Blu-rays came out, what they started to do is they, they freeze frames on Boba Fett as he was walking around in his like what thirteen minutes of, t of screen time, mm -hmm. and they recognized like oh this this thing on here on his arm we we've never quite been able to figure out what it is but it, it's a it's a calculator, and we were able to they were able to figure out what brand that calculator was. So that they were able to go track it down and they could integrate it into their suits. And it was now just a little bit more accurate. Um, the little bits on his knees, the little the dart things, those are like dental picks. And they, you just never been able to see them in that resolution before. So that was another really, that was a, like an aha moment for me. Because like, oh, well, of course, you know, you, you, if you can see something, you can, you can track down more information about it. And if you can't see it, it just never occurred to me that you just wouldn't have been able to have seen those things in that detail before. Um, so that was a, that was a really kind of a neat revelation. Well, I will say this, uh, this entire book is full of fun revelations. So thank you for writing it and putting it together. And thank you for spending this time with me today. Well, thank you for reading it. I'm really, I'm thrilled you liked it and that you found it to be interesting and exciting and full of revelations. <laughs> it's been sitting in my head for since 2016. And, um, you know, it's, it's nice to have people realize that it's not just a nonsense or garbage that is just poured out of my head. So <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a real joy.
Andrew, in case any of our listeners have follow-up questions, and they probably will, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Andrew Liptak. You can find me on Instagram at Liptak AA. That's L-I-P-T-A-K-A-A. I think I left Instagram at one point, and then when I came back, Andrew Liptak had been taken. So, and then um, the other place you can find me is a, I read a newsletter called Transfer Orbit, and you can find that at um, transfer-orbit.ghost.io. And um, that's where I write about science fiction, fantasy, history, um, pop culture, the intersections with real life. And if all goes well, I'm going to probably write some more. I'll certainly be writing more about cosplay, but um, I have an idea for um, something I'm calling the lost chapters, which is stuff I didn't quite get to for the book. So I didn't get around to writing a chapter about furries, which is something I really wanted to do and just it sort of ran out of time. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things that at, at some point over the next couple of months, I'm going to be going back and doing a little bit of research and just writing up some of those things to sort of add on to the book um, because I um, really want to learn. I want to keep learning more about it and, um, you know, adding more to the story. I want to once again thank Andrew for hanging out with me and talking about a topic I certainly and pretty obviously love. That book, which is Cosplay, A History, will come out June 28th, but you can pre-order it now wherever books are sold. And then I have a little listener mail for this one that is a special request from our listener, Christine, who writes, Hi, Tracy and Holly. My son, Alex, has been listening to your podcast at bedtime for years. I turned him on to Stuff You Missed in History class when he was having a hard time settling down at night. Now your show is part of his nightly ritual, and he is always pulling up facts that he learned from it. Recently, his class visited the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, and he was excited that he already knew about famous inmate Al Capone because of the show. Alex's birthday is coming up on June 20th, so what we are doing today is wishing Alex a very, very happy birthday. Uh, I hope it is wonderful and you have a great time and that you uh, get all of the love and delight and delicious things that everyone should get on their birthday. Oh, yay. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Alex. I won't sing that song because I don't like it, but... (laughs) I do love birthdays, so I hope it's a great one. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History, and you can subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.